Yeah. Well, good morning. Uh, we're thankful that you're here. Uh, we're thankful for all of you on behalf of uh, the elders of the church. We just want to take a second to let you know how much y'all mean to us. And, um, you, you know, before we really begin, I want to read a verse. Um, Matthew 8. Um, this is what Jesus says. He says, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, And the reason I wanted to to bring that passage up was when we were singing that last song, right? Your blood has washed away my sins. Jesus, thank you. Uh, The wrath of God is completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemies... Now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. I think it's lost on us how profound it is that we actually have a place at the table. Um, Not not only was there a a sin issue that Jesus died to overcome, right? The the sin that separates us from God. When you read the scripture through... um, through human eyes, there's also something, there's also another issue. And that issue is that we're not Jewish. And that's a pretty big issue. It's a massive issue, actually. Um, we would have been considered unclean. Because to be seated at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob means to be, means to, to the people that would have read this, the people that wrote this, means that you were, you were Jewish. And what Jesus says here is remarkable. Many will come from east and west. Canaanites, um, Phoenicians, Syrians, right? And many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom while the sons of darkness will be cast, while, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, The fact that we're able to to sing, thank you. Once your enemy is now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you is remarkable because um, of the passage, for one reason, the passage we're gonna read today. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 39. Um, This is the word of the Lord. And after I read it, we'll pray. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for for she's crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he said, It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. And Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He went up on the mountain and sat down there and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put him at his feet and he healed them so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. 
Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending the, away the crowds, he got into the boat and he went to the region of Magadan. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We're thankful, God, for faith as the distinguishing characteristic of who we are, as the identity marker of who we are, that we can come and you see us, Lord, as we approach you only on the basis of faith, not because of what we commend, not because of our ancestry, not because of what we've accumulated, not because of our intellect, not because of our righteousness, not because of our, the way that we adhere to your law, but that when we come to you, son of David, God of Israel, you look upon us through the eyes of faith. And by grace through faith, you've given us a seat at your table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Lord, that you have grafted us in into a bloodline of which we would have no right or hope to ever be a part of promises that don't belong to us apart from the gift of your grace through faith in Christ Jesus. We pray that you would help us to glory in what Jesus accomplished for us Gentile dogs that eat crumbs from the master's table. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. If I were to give a one-sentence summary of this section of scripture, right, it, it would be this. Faith is what we identify as. Um, you know, in the world we live in today, we all identify as something. And it's on the bottom of our emails or it's, you know, told to our teachers at school. And part of the reason it's, it's that way, right, is because deep inside, we, we long for some sort of identity marker. We long for some sort of answer. There's, there's this chasm, this cavern of just deep desire to, to, to the need to know who we are and why we were created and what our purpose is and what makes us different from someone or similar to, like all of those things are, are baked into us as humans. And when you come to God's word, right, he gives us faith as our identity marker. And when you look at this, this, this text, it's filled with identity markers. And it doesn't matter, you know, what your personal pronoun is. It doesn't matter what you identify as. This is a human issue. Every human being in civilization, no matter where they live, right, they have some sort of of tribal identity marker that says I'm part of this group or I'm part of that group or this is why I belong or this is why I don't belong. It's just, that's just who, who we are. And when you come to this text, you're confronted with it, right? But look at what he says. <laughs> you go to the district of Tyre and Sidon and behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. And so automatically, you are confronted with two people groups that are against one another. Son of David, who represents Israel, who has reaches far back, right, into Israel's history, the conquest of Canaan, where Israel systematically murdered the inhabitants of Canaan at God's direction, right? And then intermixed with the people of Canaan and worshiped their gods and married they're women, all right? So we have all of this, and, and God brought judgment down. And so you have people groups that are separate that do, that do this. There's violence, there's bloodshed, there's history here between Israel, whose king is David, the Davidic king, and Canaan. And Israel, they would call the Canaanites dogs. They're unclean. That's just what they are if you're a Jew. And so you have, right? And Jesus takes, Jesus takes this 
structured language that's used by people that live in different regions that to, to describe one another, and he works within that framework. And so when he's approached by this Canaanite woman, you know, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Israel, sheep. It's not good to give what's holy to the dogs, Canaanites, unholy, dogs. This is, where, this is the language. This is the structure of language that Jesus is using here. And it's about identity, who we are, people groups, Americans and Russians, Russians and Ukrainians, Palestinians and Israelis. That's what we have here. That's the world in which we live. Nationalism is built on this principle. Arianism is built on this principle. Well, (laughs) and what Jesus does, born into a world, right? Jesus is born into a world where all of this conflict and tension exist, where people look at each other that way, all right? And he puts a different path forward. He puts forward a path of equality that doesn't look like equality. But it's the only path forward. It's the only way forward. And what Jesus is going to say is there, there aren't necessarily Jews and Greeks or Jews and Canaanites or Israelis and Palestinians or Russians or Ukrainians or or, or whomever or whatever, African-Americans and Caucasians. it's, It's the only way to divide humanity. The only way that, that Jesus does it is he does it with, by this, faith and faithlessness. Because when we get to the end of all of it, this is the great irony of it all. When we come to the point to which all of history is moving, everything that we experience will be a footnote in the annals of history. A footnote. Just, but when history goes to where it's going, that's what you're left with. People who have faith that covers every atrocity and people who don't. And the divisions that we make here and now, they don't matter. Ultimately, they won't matter. That is the great irony of all of this. And what Jesus does in his life is he interacts in a shocking way with people with whom he has no business interacting, namely women. Sorry, ladies. It just wasn't like it is now for the ladies back then, you know. You have it made nowadays. I mean, there's equal pay. <laughs> the pain of childbirth, menopause. I mean, your whole life's in front of you. He is, and with the people group with whom he has no business speaking, the, the Canaanites. Because look, look here. The promises of God were made to who? Abraham. Abraham is the father of many nations. From Abraham descended the Jewish people. To them, the law was given. To them, the promises were made. To be a God-fearer really is to be a Jew. And depending on whether you're buying or selling, that's still offensive. But what I'm going to say real quick, right, before we just jump into Matthew is that What Christ Jesus does for us by faith is by faith, in a sense, he makes us Jewish. 
Jesus died so that you could be a Jew. Now, I said that one time when we first planted this church. Oh, and you want to know a, a fit people that were offended. They came up to me after, they said, don't ever call me a Jew again, ever. I used to live among them. I don't want to be a Jew. Okay. Imagine Jesus. Imagine going into the Gaza Strip and saying, salvation is from the Jews. And figuring out what kind of what kind of pickle you think you found yourself in. And you don't really have to imagine going to the Gaza Strip. It just depends on where you say it. And yet, this is Jesus' message. But unless the gospel changes the categories of your mind and the and the, and the categories of identity in your mind and in your heart, you won't embrace. You don't. We, you won't embrace what he means, and that's our problem, right? How many of you watch? How many of you watch Alabama basketball? What an excellent basketball team we have this year! You know, almost three straight games over a hundred points. I thought we were going to have it, but I missed some. But if you ever notice in Coleman Coliseum, there's a there's a thing along the uh, scores table. It says Jesus took timeouts too. He gets us, right? There's this whole he gets us campaign. The problem, though, is not that, it's not whether or not Jesus gets us, it's whether or not we get him. Jesus calls timeouts just like we do. But he doesn't do with his timeout the things that we do. We call a timeout so we can binge Netflix or binge Amazon Prime or watch movies or whatever, you know. Jesus calls, or, or we call timeout when we're losing or to stop momentum or to make an adjustment, right? When Jesus calls timeout, he's not calling timeout for any of those things. He calls timeouts, but just not the way we call them. And that is the human condition. We want him to get us, but we don't take any time to get him. So when he comes and he uses the language of the day, like, it's not good to give what's holy to the dogs. We are as offended as they are. And the Jews are as happy as every Israeli would be. He gets us. He gets us. He sees it. It's a Canaanite dog woman. He gets us. He gets us. Jesus hates Canaanites too. Okay. We are saved by grace through, t- through faith. There's two passages I want to look at. I want to take the time to, to look at two passages that are not in Matthew so that we can understand where this all comes from. Romans 4 verses 1 through 12. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, his ancestry, his, our DNA? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, His faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, Psalm 32, 1 through 2, and those whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the Jews or also for the Romans or the Palestinians? or the Ukrainians, or the Russians, or the Americans. For, for we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he'd been circumcised? Was it before he was circumcised with the Jewish mark of identity, or was it after? Well, it was not after he was circumcised, but before, 
He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he already had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Why is this important? Is this a medical chart? Doctor, what did he was he to receive circumcision before he believed or after? I think it was I think it was after he believed. Oh, okay, good. We'll mark that. We'll know. What is what, what's Paul talking about here? With this almost lewd language. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make Abraham the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Paul, being a circumcised Jew, right, from the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, looks at his history and he says, God did it this way. He justified Abraham by his faith before he was circumcised so that the promises that were made by God to Abraham would not only be for a circumcised Jew, but also for an uncircumcised Gentile. For Abraham is the father of the uncircumcised and the circumcised by faith. As long as the people who are his children walk in faith like Abraham, they are sons of God. That's where Paul goes with all of it. Faith makes us related to Abraham. He also says it again in Galatians 3. Turn over there really quick. Galatians 3, 5 through 29. He says, Does he who supplies this spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? What's important? That we keep God's law like an Israelite or is it important that we are people of faith like Abraham? Another way to say it is, from whom do you want to really be descended? Moses, the lawgiver, the law keeper, the law breaker, or Abraham, the man of faith? Those are the two people with whom Judaism does this. Which one is it? Well, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Let's get to verse 25. Now faith has come. We're no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male, female. You are all one in Christ Jesus, verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. And so Paul, right, has looked at all of the promises that God made to Abraham. Abraham, who is a father of many nations, who has descendants that are as numerous as the sea, right? The sand of the sea. And he says, how does all this come about? What is it that differentiates True Israel from Israel. What is it that makes people the true people, the, the true people of God and the offspring of Abraham? Paul comes to the conclusion that what matters is not bloodline, but faith. Well, where does he get that from? Is he just clever? I never thought about reading the Old Testament that way. Well, that belief. That reality is baked in to the way Jesus treats people in the Gospels. 
So when Paul looks at all of it together, there is absolute congruency with God's plan for Israel and those who are Abraham's offspring by faith. Which is what we see in Matthew 15, verses 24 through 28, right? Matthew 15, 24 through 28, we read it once. Let's read it again. A a, a Canaanite woman approaches Jesus. Let me get in Matthew, not Mark. And he says, she says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Which is remarkable because it's a Canaanite appealing to a Jewish king typological figure, right? O son of David, my daughter severely oppressed by a demon. Jesus didn't answer a word. His disciples came and begged him, just to send her away. She's crying out after us. He's making a scene here. Let's make it go away. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's just not fitting to feed the children, to feed the dog before you feed the kids. We don't take the kids' food and let the kids go hungry and feed the animals. Contrary to popular belief in today's day and age. Animals over people, right? Jesus. He may get us, but if you think like that, he doesn't get you. (laughs) But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. It's not right to take the children's bed and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord. Yet, Yet even... The dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Oh, woman, great is your faith. And that's one of the points I got right here, right? The next slide, faith can be, faith can be offensive and it just really depends. You know what's interesting? Who was here last week? Anybody come? God bless you. Come back. Who was offended last week? Not by me. Not by me. In the text. Who was offended? Anybody remember? Heather remembers. Anybody want to say it? The Pharisees. I think somebody said the Pharisees. The Pharisees Pharisees were mad, right? You know, they approached Jesus, Jewish people, sons of the kingdom. Hey, hey, we got a question. Why do your followers break the commands of our elders? They eat bread without washing their hands first. And Jesus says, why do you, for the sake of your tradition, break the command of God? For you say, whatever to your parent, whatever would be given to you is already given to God. Thus, the command to honor your father and mother, you break it. And the disciples came to Jesus and they said, do you know, he, they were offended by what he said. Just then. So you have an offendable group that we've already met at the first part of Matthew 15. And now you come to a woman who some would say has every right to be offended. I mean, would you be offended if someone implied that you were an unclean dog? If salvation was from the Russians, this is just for, you have to kind of bend your mind, right? Because most of the modern church in America thinks that they are God's chosen people and God's chosen nation. So it's impossible for us to be offended by this language because we're like, I'm glad he's not talking to me. Well, he is, you're Gentile. All right. Salvations from the Russians. Does that sound like a good Russian accent? Well, you know, dog, American dog. 
And you say, you know, even the dogs, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the czar's table. Please help me. Great is your faith. I mean, the, the lady, right? I mean, we get, we live in a society where everybody's offended, man. White people are offended. Black people are offended. Straight people are offended. Gay people are offended. Palestinian people are offended. Israelis are offended. Russians are offended. Jews are, I mean, it doesn't matter. It, everybody is up in arms about something. We think of it as our inherent right to be offended. Especially in matters like this. Are you going to label me? Because of my genealogy where I'm from? That makes me unclean? That makes me a dog? And there is not a hint of that in this woman. Not a hint. You know why? Because when you embrace faith as the way, it kills that source of pride that lashes out for a sense of identity. And suddenly you don't care if people know if you have money or people know if you're dirt poor. And you don't care if you just, people know you can't, you know who my parents, you know? My, my parents founded Athens. We lived in Coxie our whole lives. Who do you think we are? You are. I mean, what faith comes into those places that we don't want to admit's there, right? It, we don't want to admit that, that that it's there. And faith comes into those places. And when it does, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Faith does that. It's the faith is the only path towards equality, towards anti-Semitism, towards anti-Muslim phobia, or whatever. It, it, faith is the only way to get there, and it can be offensive. It just depends on how offendable you are. And if you're a if your source of pride or the tradition of the elders, when Jesus speaks to you, you're going to walk away ticked. And if it's being a Canaanite, you're going to walk away ticked. And if your identity is oppression and you come to Jesus, you're going to walk away ticked. And if your, idea is oppre- if your identity is a oppressor and you come to Christ and you hear what he says, you're going to walk away ticked, offended. Because that's what the gospel does. It takes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, it puts them around the table and it tells people who have lived their entire lives, a tradition of when they eat dinner and what they eat and what cele- when they celebrate holidays and how they do it are built around these cornerstones. And it says, you have no place here. And it beckons in the Canaanite woman, the Ethiopian eunuch, the Roman centurion. But this is the thing, right? <laughs> if, if we can embrace faith in Christ, what we see is that faith lavishes us, right? Sometimes we get so bent out of shape that Jesus referred to somebody as a Canaanite dog that we fail to see that the table that she eats from is the same table, the meal that she eats from is the same meal, and all of the works and miracles that these people receive are the same. That's why the rest of the chapter's here. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon, right? 
He, he heals the woman's daughter. It says in verse 29, he went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He's still in Canaanite ter- territory. We know this because they worship the God of Israel. That's a Canaanite way of referring to Israel's God. We also know this because of Mark and the way Mark tells this same story. So he's still in the Canaanite regions. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, many others. And they put him at his feet and he healed them so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking and the crippled healthy, the lame walking and the blind seeing. And they glorified Israel's God. They get more in beside the Sea of Galilee in in the regions of Tyre and Sidon than they got in Nazareth from people in his own bloodline. Then Jesus called his disciples to him. I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days. I can't send them away. They're going to faint. We got to feed them, right? Does this sound familiar? We just talked about it a couple chapters ago, right? What are we going to feed them, you know? I mean, (gasps) which I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just unbelief or maybe is it like you know the person that you know could help you out of a financial situation but you're just afraid to ask them to do it ah uh, you know <laughs> i don't know here we gonna kind of in a mess but what i don't know what it is e- either way they don't really want to go there and jesus says well, what kind of food we have and they say well we have what seven loaves and a couple of fish seven and a few small fish crowd sits down he takes it he breaks it he gives thanks they distribute it and they take up seven baskets full of the broken pieces. Last story, they took up 12, probably symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. I think the reason that they took up seven here, um, and, and maybe not 12, is because it puts a little separation between the 12 tribes of Israel and the Jewish descent, right, from what happened in Jewish territory. And it kind of symbolizes the wholeness or the completeness of what we're going to see when God's gospel goes to the Gentiles, hence the number the number seven. But faith, what it does is it lavishes us. And what this shows us is until we can embrace Christ Jesus as our identifier and our identity and the master that that puts crumbs, that lavishes us with things from his table, we'll, we'll never view faith the right way. Faith lavishes us. That's what this text teaches. And when we don't exercise faith and we cling on to other the other identities, right? Whether it's political affiliation, you know, nationalistic pride, whatever it is, if we take that and we make it our identity, that's when you're that's when you're scraping for crumbs. Because you're always offended. You're always looking at the wrong thing to give you purpose, to give you a sense of identity, for it to all work. When in all actuality, faith and only faith is what gives us the right to be at the table. John 1, 11 through 13. Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive them. But as many as did receive him who believed in his name, he gave them the right to be called children of God who were born not of flesh, not of the will of man or the power of man, but of God. Faith's the only thing that gives us a right to anything. And when you exercise faith, the thing that some people want to grasp is their right to be at. Looks like a dog hovering underneath the table. It doesn't matter. The eyes of faith replace it. And you no longer go, what should be me sitting up there? You go, man, just to be a dog. Like I get to be around it. I get to be, I get to be that. I get to be a part of that. That's what faith does. And when you look at it that way, you're already seated at the table. You just don't know it. That's the beauty of faith. The ones that keep up with a place at the table and whether or not they're at it and who said what do I, that's not faith. And that's the wonderful twist of this account. What looks like breadcrumbs to an ethnic Jew that's offended about Jesus breaking the tradition of the elders, what looks like dog crumbs to them is actually a seat at the table. 
And it really just depends on if you have faith or if you don't. And I end this sermon with a call and a plead to have faith in Christ, to let all of those things go, those identity markers that we harbor up. And let me tell you something, it's sophisticated, folks, because trauma can be an identity marker. Hurt can be an identity. It's what we, it gives us our purpose. And we actually feel power by formerly being oppressed or hurt or injured or whatever. And what we don't see is that we're forever enslaved to a false identity. And what the gospel does is it comes and it confronts all of those little mini gods that we put up in our lives. And they're everywhere. They're on your phone, right? They're in the mirror. They're in your checking account. They're in your, they're in your investments, right? They're in your portfolio. They're everywhere. They are absolutely everywhere. And the gospel comes in and it confronts every one of them. And then they start to fall over and you start to feel super, really super insecure because you're like, I don't even know anything he said this morning. So I don't know if I'm even, I'm confused as I'll get out. Or you, you, you get to, all of these things happen, right? And then God just presses further in with faith and with the gospel. And he says, trust me, believe in me, right? Some people see religion as an identity marker. The religion they were taught, the religion they've learned from someone else that they believed all their, I mean, it could be anything. The possibilities are endless. It could be the opposite of everything I just said. It could be money, power, wealth. You're the one that fixes the problem. You're the one that makes the people happy. You're the one everyone looks to. You're the one who, whatever it says, that's the gospel. It's an identity marker. And what Christ does, he comes and he levels the playing field. We're all dogs yapping at the feet of our master. That's what it looks like in sin. That's what it looks like to people that want the power of the world. But when you have the eyes of faith seated with Christ at the Father's right hand, all authority and power given to him, we are people who judge the world. We judge angels with Christ in the heavenly places. That's where we're seated, right? And it just depends on how you choose to see it. And my prayer is that the Spirit would move and that God would grant you the gift of faith. If you're not a believer, that you would repent of the old way and embrace Christ at your place at the table. You might be able to give thanksgiving for the perfect and spotless gift, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and by faith receive an inheritance among all of those who are sanctified by his great name. And we're gonna pray and invite you to come if you need anything. To the front. Lord, thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you for your mercy that's new every morning. We're thankful that you lavish us with gifts of your grace, and it may look like breadcrumbs to everybody else, but we know our status. We know we are your children. We know where we are seated. We know the inheritance that is ours. We know that we're citizens of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, whose builder and maker is God. We know more about your glory, Lord, than a lifetime of sinners have forgotten. We've forgotten more about it than they know, God. And we, we praise you for being so kind to us. Shower your kindness on those who don't believe. Give them the gift of faith. Open their eyes. Help them to be obedient to the gospel and embrace freedom, healing, truth, equity, justice, goodness, all that you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.